I want to thank Brandon uh, and, and the Staglin family and Imro for putting together this fantastic music festival. And I want to thank all of you for coming. Um, you know, one of the things that, that I really benefit from, uh, you know, coming here is, is talking to uh, all of you. And that's why I need you to listen to the science. I need you guys to ask me questions because, you know, these questions, um, these discussions, they're incredibly energizing. When I share science with you and, and I get back enthusiasm and interest, that's what keeps me going. And, and the questions that I get really stimulate my work to, to go in new directions. So I, I really hope that this presentation will be the start of that kind of, uh, that kind of discussion. So I'm going to tell you about two projects today um, and, and build up to the one that uh, Dr. Hyman just told you about. And first, I'm going to tell you about some work in mice uh, looking at a particular group of cells that we think are important in schizophrenia. So we know that, that our brain is made up of cells called neurons, that these neurons, they talk to each other. Some neurons excite other neurons. Other neurons inhibit other neurons. And, and we know that there's a particular group of inhibitory neurons called parvalbumin interneurons that are, are particularly important in schizophrenia. They seem to be abnormal in schizophrenia. And I, I'm going to talk a little bit about why that might be the case and what we can do about it. So here's, here's actually a picture of a, of a, of a parvalbumin interneuron. These are, the, these are the little processes that it uses to talk to other neurons. This is a picture of parvalbumin in that neuron. And I'm going to show you electrical activity of these parvalbumin interneurons in two cases, in, in normal mice and in mutant mice that have problems with the development of inhibitory neurons. Now, what we've done here is we've actually injected in electrical current to stimulate these neurons. And you can see the response of this neuron. You can see all these wavy things. They look like spikes. They're called spikes. Um, these spikes are what let one neuron transmit a signal to another neuron. And I think what, what all of us can see is that if you look at the, the normal mouse's parvalbumin interneuron, you can see, hey, you know, there's a lot of these spikes. Uh, it keeps generating spikes without any problem. But, but if you look at this, this mutant uh, mouse's parvalbumin interneuron, you can see that, that you know, in, the, in a technical way, these spikes poop out, right? They seem to, to be running down, and it seems not to be quite as good at generating those spikes that are important for one neuron to talk to another one. And so we can actually measure how well these parvalbumin interneurons talk to each other. We can record from some neurons that, that receive signals from these parvalbumin interneurons, again, in, in black in, in normal mice and in blue in the mutant mice. And again, you can see that, that these signals are way weaker. The parvalbumin interneurons are not able to talk to other neurons nearly as well in these mutant mice. And that, that sort of looks like what we see in schizophrenia, where we know these parvalbumin interneurons are broken. Okay. Well, so what? what? What's the big deal? Well, we know that these parvalbumin interneurons do some really important things in the brain. In particular, they generate brain waves. Now, you guys all know about brain waves. That's the name of the blog that, that Brandon uh, does. And brain waves, of course, are electrical activity in, in the brain that you can actually see outside of the brain. You can put a, an electrode on your scalp and record brain waves. And some of you may have heard brain waves are different if you're awake or asleep or if you're concentrating or if you're relaxed. And we know that these parvalbumin interneurons are important for generating these brain waves. So we decide to look at them in, in normal mice and in these mutant mice. And what we, we, we can actually measure brain waves. There are all these little fluctuations, these wiggles. And there are slow wiggles and fast wiggles. And we can look at these wiggles at different speeds. And, and don't worry too much about this, but we can actually measure the size of slow wiggles at low frequencies and fast wiggles at high frequencies. And it turns out that there's a group of high frequency wiggles between about 30 and 100 or 120 hertz. These are called gamma oscillations or gamma waves or gamma rhythms. And it turns out that we, we know that these are generated by these parvalbumin interneurons. And we know that they're abnormal in schizophrenia. So what happens to these gamma oscillations in our mutant mice? Well, we can actually measure these when normal mice are doing tasks like learning a new rule or interacting with new mice. OK, and this just shows the size of wiggles at different frequencies and what happens during these tasks in normal mice. And as these big black bars show you, then in normal mice, these tasks evoke big increases in gamma oscillations. But in our mutant mice, just as happens in schizophrenia, these big increases are blunted. They just, they just aren't quite there as strong in the rule shift case. And they really aren't there at all in the case where, where one mouse is interacting with another mouse. Now, again, it's kind of like, well, what, what's, what's the big deal about these gamma waves? Why are we talking about them so much? Well, we think these are really important for the way our brain performs certain functions. So let me show you one example of what happens in these mutant mice. We can test these mice on their ability to learn a rule. Like, 
in this case, this mouse has to choose between these two bowls and find the bowl that has food, and it uses a rule to do that. So maybe it knows that, that the bowl that smells like garlic is the one that contains food, or the bowl that's filled with wood chip is the one that, that contains food. So we can measure how long it takes mice to learn these rules. And here we've shown how normal mice do with these, these black circles and how the mutant mice do with these blue circles, and we just measure how many tries does it take a mouse to learn this rule. And what you can see is that the normal and mutant mice, they do fine on the first rule. But on the second rule, when the rule changes from paying attention to garlic to paying attention to wood chip, these mutant mice have real troubles, OK? They have trouble paying attention to something new. They have trouble being flexible. And this is the exact same kind of thing that we see in a lot of different forms of mental illness, autism, and, and schizophrenia, OK? So we know that these kinds of cognitive difficulties, changing what we pay attention to in a, in a rapid and flexible way, they're a problem not just for these mice, they're a huge problem in these diseases. So of course you want to know, can we fix it? So I, I put a picture of Bob the Builder here. My kids love Bob the Builder. It, he can basically fix anything. Uh, a lot of things, and even in our house, I can't fix. Um, but he has a lot of cool tools that he uses to fix things. And in the lab, we have a lot of cool tools also. And in particular, we have tools that actually allow us to turn certain neurons in the brain on or off with light. Okay, and right now we only use these in, in mice, but we can use them to turn on the inhibitory cells that aren't working as well. We can turn on these parvalbumin interneurons, and we can turn them on at, at a specific frequency that matches that of the normal gamma oscillations. And we can ask, well, what happens if we do that? So we can basically test these mice on their ability to learn a new rule in the absence of any light, and then again, when they get this light stimulation and we, and we restore these gamma frequency patterns of activity, and then again, following that, what did they learn from doing this task? And we look at two different groups. You know, we always do this in science. We have a control group that's shown in white. And those are just mutant mice that, that don't get effective light stimulation. And then in yellow, I show what happens in the mutant mice that do get effective light stimulation. And what you find is that the normal mice on day one, on day two, on day three, they keep having trouble with this task. They always take many, many trials to learn this rule change. But the, the mice that get the light stimulation at gamma frequency, they have a hard time on day one, but once we turn on the lights on day two, it's like the lights went on for them. All of a sudden, they learn this rule change. And what's amazing is if you just leave them alone and you come back the next day, you don't do anything more to them and you just test them again, they again learn this rule change really quickly at the same rate as normal mice. In fact, you can test them a week later, and you can test them on a different rule change, and they still, it's like they had a eureka moment. They get this task. They understand how it works. They can learn it quickly. So what's the moral of this story? Well, the moral of this story is there are cells. These cells generate patterns of activity in the brain, and those patterns of activity are important for both normal and abnormal behavior. And yes, we, we can fix abnormal behaviors, but we have to understand the underlying patterns of normal and abnormal activity to do so. And what I didn't tell you is that if we tried to stimulate these neurons, if we flashed the light at different frequencies, right, not at gamma frequencies, so too slow or too fast, it didn't work. We actually had to use the right pattern of activity in order to essentially fix these gamma oscillations and get these mice learning again, OK? So <clears throat> where are we going from here? Well, obviously, we want to go. Um, and look at humans. And so this is the project that Dr. Hyman talked about. And maybe in the back, if you can just click on this movie so that it starts playing. So this is a collaboration that's funded by the President's Brain Initiative. And what you're looking at here are patterns of activity in the human brain. So these were recorded by a neurosurgeon at UCSF, Eddie Chang. And he's looking at, at patients with epilepsy before they have surgery. And as you can imagine, many of these patients also have depression, anxiety, chronic pain, you name it. And what you're looking at on, on the vertical axis here is different frequencies, and, and then along these other axes, different locations in the brain. And so you can see there are these blobs of activity that seem to appear and disappear. And what that tells you is, hey, activity in the brain isn't random. It's not noisy. You're not looking at static. You're seeing blobs that appear that span across multiple locations in the brain and multiple frequencies. So there are patterns of activity in the human brain, and our goal is to develop sophisticated new mathematical ways to see the big picture of these patterns. So we can say, hey, when, when someone was feeling depressed or anxious, what was the pattern of activity in the brain? Or when they were feeling hopeful and confident, what was the pattern of activity in the brain? 
And, you know, last year at this symposium, we heard about new ways of, of basically teaching people skills to help them overcome deficits associated with things like schizophrenia. And, and obviously, that's a, that's a difficult and time-consuming process. But if we knew what the patterns of activity in the brain were that were associated with recovery, we might be able to stimulate the brain in order to facilitate that learning. Or we might be able to figure out other things, like meditation, that naturally enhance those patterns of activity and make that learning easier. So, the brain is an incredibly complex organ, and these patterns of activity are incredibly complex. But instead of running away from that complexity, we're trying to, to understand it, because we think if we understand it, we can harness it in order to, to really facilitate uh, learning and recovery. Thank you.